This second virus lecture will show you some examples and help you to solidify your understanding of the concepts we talked about in the first lecture. We will then talk about infectious agents that are even smaller than viruses and in looking at important events in virology right now. We start with Q-beta. Q-beta is a simple, positive, single-stranded RNA virus that infects E. coli. Since it encodes a coding strand, the host translates it directly in at a ribosome into four genes. A maturation protein, A2, two coproteins, C, A1, and a replicase, R. A1 forms because of a mistake by the ribosome. About 1 in 20 times it reads through a stop codon, inserting a tryptophan instead. This error leads to the A1 protein. A viral capsid needs 60 coat proteins and 3 A1 proteins. So it's clear this mistake is by design because you get exactly that. 20 coat proteins for every 1 A1 protein. Since Q-beta is an RNA virus, it must encode its own replicase. As the replicase is made, it begins copying the viral RNA, first into a negative strand and then into a positive strand. When enough maturation protein accumulates, it will lyse the cell. Wait, you might say, how does this maturation protein not lyse the cells early since it's also being transcribed? It turns out a2 has a lousy translation start site, and it doesn't get translated that often. Or well, enough only accumulates when there is a lot of positive viral strand RNA around, and this only happens late in infection. These are being then assembled into capsids and complete virions, and then the cell lyses. Another example of a bacteriophage is T4. This virus is large and complex, but can only perform a lytic cycle. However, many genes need to be synthesized, as you can see in the diagram on the right. If they are all turned on at the same time, T4 would never be able to replicate. Instead, T4 gene expression happens in waves. Early in infections, proteins are expressed that shut down host operations and prepare the host cell for viral replication. In the middle phase, DNA polymerases are made that make copies of the phage DNA. Yep, this virus makes its own DNA polymerase. In the late phase, the viral capsid proteins are made and assembled. Very late in the process, the two lysis proteins are synthesized to allow the virus to exit the cell. Our third example is bacteriophage lambda. Bacteriophage lambda is the classic example of a lysogenic virus. Similar to T4, it also has early, middle, and late gene expression. However, early proteins decide what path the virus will venture down, lytic or lysogenic. Ingeniously, the virus bases this decision to lysogenize or lyse upon the health of the host cell. Cells with nutrients are actively growing and have high protease activity, including the protein FDSH which is a protease. Since the whole cell is actively growing, that probably means there are many cells in the vicinity that the virus can infect. The primary regulatory switch for the virus is the C2 protein. If it is active, it will push the virus down the lysogenic pathway. If it is unstable, the virus will enter the lytic cycle. C2 is a target of FTSH. Thus, in actively growing cells, FTSH is present and active and will degrade C2 and the virus will go lytic and lyse the cells. In cells that are not growing, FDSH is not as active. C2 will remain and the virus will enter the lysogenic cycle and insert into the host DNA. This is a clever example of a virus sensing the state of its host cell by using host proteins and then responding accordingly. True or false? Viruses are the smallest known disease-causing agents. Of course, you probably guessed, the correct answer is false. There are agents that are even smaller than viruses that cause disease in plants and animals. Viroids are one example. Viroids are circular, single-stranded RNA molecules that replicate inside plants. 
The viral RNA does not encode protein, but fools the host into making copies of it. Viroids are thought to cause disease possibly by an RNA silencing mechanism. Plant cells recognize and degrade double-stranded RNA hybrids, which is a host immune response against RNA viruses. However, viroids hide from this by making a double-stranded RNA hybrid between itself and host messenger RNA. This co-opting of host messages results in them not getting translated and it also prevents the viroid from getting destroyed. If essential host messages are not translated, the host plant cell then has disease. Prions are proteinaceous infectious particles encoded by the PRP gene. The accumulation of them inside a host neural tissue causes dementia, loss of balance, and death in about one year. The PRP protein is a normal protein found in mammals. Disease only occurs when this protein shifts from a normal form to the disease form. The PRP protein is hypothesized to function in the assembly of signal molecules at the cell surface. So it has a normal host function that is essential. However, when this protein misfolds, it will polymerize and accumulate in plaques to precipitate in the cells and interfere with neural function. It is infectious because this abnormal protein can cause normal proteins to change shape to the abnormal function. All human diseases result in progressive degeneration of the brain and death. These diseases are Crutchfield-Jacobs disease, Kuro, fetal familiar insomnia, and Gertzmann strassler schenker syndrome. There are also animal diseases caused by prions. Two you may have heard of are mad cow disease and chronic wasting disease. CWD currently affects 251 counties in 24 states with reported CWD in free ranging surveys in 2019. We'll have more to say about this later in the semester. All right, let's check your comprehension. A new bacteriophage is discovered that contains double-stranded RNA for its genome. It replicates in, compare T4 to Lambda. What genes do they have in common? What genes generally does Lambda have that T4 does not? You discover a new virus in your filtrate from Lake Mendota. You sequence the genome and find the virus codes for lysozyme. What kind of host would this virus infect? Finally, what step is shown in this figure? Okay, the correct answer to the first question is B, the cytoplasm. While double-stranded DNA viruses of eukaryotes would re replicate in the nucleus where the host enzymes are, a bacteriophage infects a bacterium which doesn't have a nucleus. Yeah, I know, a little bit of a trick question, but it really makes you think about the different capabilities. So there's, if you compare T4 and Lambda, they both have lytic cycles. They both go through early, middle, and late gene phases. And they're both double-stranded DNA viruses. However, Lambda is a lysogenic virus that can insert into the chromosome. That's what makes it different. It has the whole regulatory pathway that decides that. If since this virus encodes a lysozyme, it must be attacking peptidoglycan. Therefore, only bacteria have peptidoglycan, and the correct answer is D. And finally, this is showing penetration, the entrance of the virus into the cell. I want to end this lecture talking about two interesting trends with viruses. Shown here is the timeline of major events in the history of research on phages, phage therapy, and antibiotics. Background curves represent a qualitative measure of the overall interest, research, and use of phage therapy, yellow, and antibiotics, blue, showing how the introduction of antibiotics and the critical review of the early phage therapy studies coincided to bring phage therapy research and developments to an almost complete standstill around the 1940s. Phage therapy is making a comeback because of the emergence of bacteria that are resistant to all known antibiotics. I was lucky enough to attend a talk by Greg Merrill 
on his company, Adaptive Phage Therapeutics. Phage are the most prolific killers on Earth. The company is isolating phage for all known and important pathogens of humans, and they've actually been able to stockpile half a dozen to a dozen phage that will kill every important pathogen. And again, what this shows you is there is a virus for every organism. Greg's company is not the only one that's doing this. There's a number of different companies. But as a group, so far this therapy, used when patients were suffering from incurable infections, has met with pretty spectacular success. In most cases, as you can see in this table, there is a dramatic decrease in both disease and mortality. Probably the most famous virus right now is the virus that is causing COVID-19, and the virus is SARS-CoV-2. This is a positive single-strand RNA virus that infects humans. I will be giving you updates about this virus as we go through the semester. This virus replicates in a fashion similar to that of Cubeta, except that it does it in human cells. I will have more to say about this replication later in the semester. There are two major efforts to attack this virus. One is a vaccine. Two vaccines have successfully completed phase one clinical trials, showing them to be safe to administer and having the ability to make neutralizing antibodies. This is very encouraging news that just came out in late May. One of these vaccines is the mRNA vaccine of modern era, and the engineered vaccine invented at Oxford is the other and it's being developed in partnership with AstraZeneca. We will know in a few months that these will be effective. Animal models have shown these vaccines to be effective, but they still need to be tested in humans. Drug treatments are also progressing well. Remdesivir has shown the ability to block viral replication and shorten recovery somewhat, but it's not a cure-all. More drugs need to be developed to deal with a cytokine storm that fills the lungs with fluid and causes mortality. Convalescent plasma treatments, where antibodies are harvested from recovered patients and giving to ill individuals, are also being done. In these treatments, antibodies present in the plasma limit virus reproduction and tag the virus for elimination by the immune system. There are five studies that show this treatment being successful. Finally, I want to give a shout out to all the researchers on campus working on SARS-CoV-2. This is an area of active research on this campus. One of them is a former student of one of my colleagues and took some bacteriology classes. He's now a professor of biochemistry here and he works on the spike protein binding mechanism. He told me his life has been a little hectic of late for some reason. I have no idea why. You can see more about him following the link. But it also shows you that someday you guys may do something significant. Okay, that's the end of our lectures on viruses and the end of the module on microbial structure.